God wants to send us. Amen. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and have a seat? So I want you to hear me. I know, I know we're talking about heavy stuff. The book of Revelation is, is, uh, is not um, most people's, like, book of Psalms. If you want to get happy, a lot of people read the Psalms. But I'll tell you this. We are victorious. And because we are, because Jesus has already won every battle. We are victorious in him. Today is going to be a, uh, I'm going to try to pack a lot into a little time. I've asked for multiple people that I trust to be praying for me, that I be wise and uh, cover the things that need covered, because there's a lot that I'm going to cover. Uh, today we're going to talk about the Antichrist, the Mark of the Beast, and the coming one world religion. That's just... That should be three different messages, really. But we don't have that much time. And we don't have that much time because there's other things that need to be said. And so uh, we're going to Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from the NIV. We're starting in verses 1 through 4, and then we're going to drop down to verse 22 and read through 25. Um, Verse 1 says this, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Just so you know, that is your privilege as a disciple is to come to him privately and get answers others don't have. Came to him privately, tell us, they said, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. Dropping now down to verse 22. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, this is Jesus speaking to us right now. See, I have told you ahead of time. Going now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, The coming of the lawless one, who is the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan, with all power, and signs and lying wonders, and with unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not love the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie and that they, may not, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God is merciful. And I want you to hear me. God's mercies, Scripture says, are new every morning. But there is a point, there is a point in time that Scripture says that, that because of the people never receiving a love for the truth. That they might be saved, that God allows for, it even says that God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. God 
God is not there yet. But we are moving into a direction where people are, are having an opportunity. We have an opportunity right now to be able to reach people with the gospel. We, as the carriers of the kingdom, we as children of God have an opportunity to share the things that we know are true, to share this gospel, to introduce people to the Lord Jesus himself, to allow for his spirit to come and minister to them and bring healing, not just in their bodies, but in their minds and in their souls and in their very spirits. God, God's healing in the gospel is not just simply a ticket to heaven. It is a global healing of the person, body, soul, and spirit. But we have to love this truth. There are three, uh, I've been talking a lot for the last couple of weeks on um, like the world powers and um, where they're bringing us and how the target year seems to be 2030 from their publications. Nothing to do with speculation or, or conspiracy theory. I can give you websites from the UN and from the World Economic Forum that say that 2030 is the target year for a shift in the global uh, socioeconomic structures. The reason, like I said before, and I want you to hear me on this, most people involved in this movement are not sinister. They're not trying to bring the Antichrist to power. Some are, but most are trying to bring the world into a place where we can live in peace together. And when, when you try to do that outside of Jesus, all you've got is human answers. I know people. I've, I, when I used to be a personal trainer, I worked with professional athletes. I worked with multimillionaires. I, I, I saw people who had more money than most of us. If we put all of our eggs in one basket in this room, they'd still have more. And yet I knew millionaires who their, their china set for, for formal dinners was solid gold. But I also know that that married couple would go off two or three times a year to Jamaica to, to smoke and to party and to wife swap and all that mess. Because you can have all the human answers and still never have any peace in your soul. This whole thing that I want you to hear, I'm not preaching fear. I'm not scared of what's coming. I don't want you afraid of what's coming. But I want us to understand that we have the only answer. We have the only answer for peace in this world because we have the only answer for peace in the human heart. That is all that they're looking for. That is the ticket they're looking to punch, and it's the only one that we've got. As humans search for answers, they are trying to, to find things that can, that can bring peace through their manufacturing. And so they've done a lot of studies and they found that basically there's three primary causes for war in the world. Political, economic, and religious. I mentioned the previous two. Political is power. Economic is wealth. That was the last two weeks. But the third is religion. Until recently, the global antichrist system has been focused on what they call the public sector and the private sector. The public sector is those entities in the world that are governmental. Things that are controlled by the government, whether that be actual government structures or government controlled enterprises. Secondly, they've been focused on what is called the private sector. The private sector is individuals. And it is for-profit companies that individuals or small boards run. But that is changing. Their focus on those two points is growing to include a third. They are beginning to see religion as the key 
to what they call sustainable change. This is a um, quote from Klaus Schwab, who we mentioned last week. He is the founder and uh, CEO of the World Economic Forum. This is a direct quote from him. To address global and sy systemic challenges requires not only innovation in policy and practice, but also a commitment to certain values that make the needed policy, economic, and social changes sustainable. And values, hear this, and values are often rooted in faith. Another quote from him from the same article, values cannot be justified by intellectual processes alone. Faith must be involved. To further this direction, the World Economic Forum has sought to incorporate key faith leaders into the discussion about how to bring to pass this value that will establish, hear this, that will establish their systems and make them sustainable. One of those voices somebody that many of you will recognize. His name is Rick Warren. Rick and his wife have been for many years, I think for the last 20 or 30 years, have been on a mission to eradicate the AIDS virus, especially from Africa. Because of that good work, Rick has become very conscious of social structures and problems and and the structures that allow for those problems to continue and to grow they have brought him in to to begin to talk about the value of religion and it has come to the point that they said that basically um the private sector and the, and the public sector, those were two legs of a stool. And if you know anything about stools, they don't, land, they don't work with just two legs. You better just have one. But they have said that religion is the third leg of the stool and will bring sustainability and stability to their program. So, this Antichrist who is coming is not only going to be a political leader, but he will also be a key figure in the rising of a one world global religion. Before I can talk about the faith that he will bring, we need to kind of line out who he's going to be. And just for clarity, the reason, like I know that there's people who thought this would be like four weeks on the Antichrist. We don't have that much information. Anybody who says like, oh, they know all of these things about him is, is, is they're inflating their information. So what I'm going to offer you is a large portion. I'd say it's at least two-thirds of what I know is available for me to be able to share with you about the Antichrist. So I'm going to just kind of cover this quickly. Denise, when did I start? 38. You know, just keep an eye on me. <laughs> so this man... I want you to hear this. Who is the Antichrist going to be? Can I, can I tell you right now that he's not going to be a white American? Um, I know like if you watch the Omen series, he's always a white political leader, usually with the last name Smith, right? That ain't the guy. But he could be American. But he will be Jewish. In fact, he will be of the line of King David, who wrote most of your Psalms, who defeated Goliath on the battlefield. That David. 
the father of Solomon. See, right now, and I could send you articles if you'd like them, there are rabbis, key influential rabbis in Israel, who two years ago, three years ago, were saying that they were in direct communication with the Antichrist. Now, they didn't call him the Antichrist. They said, we are in direct communication with the Messiah. They have said, at that time, they said that he will make himself known in October of 2020. If anybody wants to know inform more information about that, you can ask me privately. But it looks like he might have made himself known like the rabbis said. With that said, though, there is, there is a criteria for Jewish people. For Judaism, there is a criteria that is established by their sage Maimonides, who, if you know anything about Israel and, and Judaism, you might know him as Rambam. That is an acronym for his name. Maimonides uh, set, he wrote the most highly regarded, most used mission, Mishnah Torah, which is basically a commentary on the Old Testament. He wrote the most influential Mishnah Torah basically in history. And in chapter 11 of his Mishnah Torah, he talks about the laws concerning kings. And in that, he sets the parameters that the Antichrist has to qualify himself by. From what I understand, this is what the Jewish people are looking for. This is a quote from Maimonides' writings. It says, the Messiah is not some kind of supernatural figure, but simply a righteous king in the line of David who will reestablish Israel's sovereignty and freedom from external domination. This is a direct quote from his writings. It says, if there arise a king from the house of David who meditates on Torah, occupies himself with the commandments, as did his ancestor David, observes the precepts prescribed in the written and oral law, prevails upon Israel to walk in the way of the Torah and to repair its breaches and fights the battles of the Lord, it may be assumed that he is the Messiah. If he does these things, hear this, if he does these things and succeeds, rebuilds the sanctuary, in other words, the temple on its site, and gathers the dispersed of Israel, he is beyond all doubt the Messiah. So the Messianic king will arise in the future. He is, like I said, a Jewish Davidic king. He's of the line of King David. It does say that, that, um, that he will arise and be a king of the house of David who meditates on the Torah and occupies himself with the commandments as did his ancestor David. The Antichrist will be a reflection. If, if anyone understands how mirrors work, I know it took me a while. You ever look at yourself in the mirror and you go, man, I look weird. Like a picture, you see a picture of yourself, you go, man, I look weird. It's because when you see yourself in, the re in a reflection in the mirror, you're seeing the opposite of yourself. And in many ways, the Antichrist is going to be the anti. He's going to be the exact opposite of Jesus Christ. It says that he will be a, a faithful Jew who meditates on the Torah and occupies himself with the commandments. In other words, he will be, in, in the initial stages of his reign, he will be a faithful Jewish follower. He restores the Davidic kingdom of Israel to its former state and its original sovereignty. Now, just so you understand, Israel was reestablished as a nation on May 14th, 1948. We just have crossed over into the 75th year of Israel's existence, which is one reason why all this mess is going on right now with the Palestinian nation. But I, though the nation was reestablished, it is not a kingdom. 
They have a ruling prime minister, and there is not even a king right now. They are waiting for the Messiah to make him a Davidic king. That is what Israel is waiting for. Like I said, he will appear to be a faithful Jew. He will lead a revival of Judaism in the Jewish people. Prevailing, it says, prevailing upon Israel to walk in the way of Torah and repair its breaches. He will rebuild the temple. And the temple worship and all the laws of sacrifice will be reestablished. Do you know that right now they already have uh, the Kohathites, the, the, the high priest lineage is already well tracked. They have people who right now have been trained to be the high priest the moment that they start and they set up the temple. Because all those temple rituals that you read about in Numbers will be reestablished and in Leviticus. They will gather, this man will gather the dispersed of Israel that were dispersed in the diaspora in 70 AD by Rome to prepare a, the whole world to serve the Lord with one accord. You see how this is setting up. This has already happened in part. Um, for anybody who'd like to read, this is one of the most amazing fulfillments of prophecy in, in the history of the world. That Isaiah 49, verses 22 and 23, literally the Lord said to the dispersed, to the dispersed people of Israel, that kings would carry their sons back to Israel and that queens would be nursing mothers. Think about that. They're talking about rulers, talking about world rulers who are going to be the ones who carry Israel back, to carry the people of Israel back. That is exactly what happened when the United Nations voted to establish, to reestablish the nation of Israel as the homeland of the Jews in 1948. That is exactly what happened. Kings carried them, and queens were their nurse mothers. So, Maimonides goes on and says, and I read this to you already, that if he does these things and succeeds and rebuilds the sanctuary, that he is beyond all doubt the Messiah. This, my brothers and sisters, is what the Jewish people are waiting for. Now, I want you to go with me in the future. And we don't know when this is. We don't know when this will be. But there will be a temple erected on the Temple Mount. There will be a situation where that temple is reestablished, the sacrifices are made, and worship again is reinitiated for the first time for the Jewish people in 2,000 years. It's going to be a momentous occasion. That is until the Antichrist really reveals himself. You go to 2 Thessalonians Chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, Paul writing to the church says this, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, meaning the day of the Lord, when the church appears to be raptured out of here. That day will not come until the, the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Who opposes, that is the Antichrist for the record, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You see, the faith of the Antichrist that will be revealed on that day is that he is a humanist. His faith is humanism. Now, according to the Cambridge Dictionary, humanism is a belief based on the principle that people's spiritual and emotional needs can be satisfied without following a god or a religion. The idea is that humans are the highest created being. That we, not only are we the highest created being, we're the highest being. 
that there's no God, that we are the product of just simply evolutionary chain of events, that we have evolved to be the supreme being in the world, and therefore, in effect, there are no gods. That is why, hear this, that is why it says that he is against everything. He's, he's against everything that is called God or worshipped. What that means is he's not just against Yahweh God. He's not just against Jesus. He's not just against Christianity. He's against everything that's called God. He's against Buddhism. He's against every of the million Hindu gods. He's against Jesus. He's against every form of religion. Because he is not just against the true God. He's against all gods because he's saying, I am God and you can be like me. Sounds a lot like a snake in a garden to me. I want you to hear this though. I want you to hear this. This will not be a hard transition to make for the Buddhists or the New Age people. Because they already believe that they are divine. They are just, Buddhism is less a religion, it's a philosophy. And it's about expanding your spirit. It's about reaching into the depths of you to become one with kind of everything. It will not even be, and I know this is going to sound a little critical, um, it's not going to be a hard thing even for Mormons. Because Mormons believe, just so you know, Mormons, and if there's any Mormons in the room, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you later. Mormons are not truly Christians because they don't believe in just one God. They believe in many. They believe that every child that is born is potentially a God of his own planet. It's humanism with a Jesus flavor. I want to also warn my brothers and sisters in the room, another key area of weakness would be for those power-focused, power-seeking Christians. If you want power in the Spirit more than you want Jesus, this is a very, very dangerous place to be. I don't want power, I want Jesus, and when I get Jesus, I get power. I get his power. I have his authority. I have his name. All of those things. That's the proper channel. If you're reaching for power outside of knowing him, that is dangerous. And that's called witchcraft. And I don't care if you call yourself by the name of Jesus. The definition of witchcraft is to exert power to control events and environments. Christians... When we step into the name of Jesus, we do that understanding that we are moving things according to his will, his power, and his authority. And he can always say no. I know I'm coming at a lot of stuff right now. But you need to understand that this man, this antichrist, is going to say to the world, I am a God because I am a fully realized human. I am a fully actualized human being. And that will be the way that the world will follow after him. Because already, already, the world wants answers outside of God. I heard a quote once by a wealthy British gentleman that said that when, when the theory of evolution came out and Darwin wrote his book, that the elites of England grabbed hold of that faith of atheism because it gave them permission to do all the things that they had wanted to do and suppress as Christians. It's just, a, it's just permission for you to behave like an animal because by Darwin's definition, that's all you are. But God says you're more than that. God says you're more than that. It's going to be difficult for true Christians, and ironically, it's also going to be difficult for them to sway the, the minds 
of Islamic people. People who, we look like we're on two opposite worlds. We're on two complete opposite poles. And yet, because our faith is in God, even if it's misdirected on the side of radical Islam, we're going to be difficult to move. But it says this when in the scriptures that I read to you. It says, for that day, meaning the day where we get, it looks like it, we get raptured out of here, will not come unless a falling away comes first. I don't have time to deal with that. But I think you're seeing in the church today a falling away. A falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed. We will probably know who the Antichrist is. We will know who he is. We'll know what he's about. But I want you to realize that when he goes into the temple that day, it will be completely clear, not just to the Christians, if we're still here. It will be completely clear also to the Jews who have enthroned him. That he is not the Messiah. He's not a faithful Jew. He is not somebody who is devoted to Yahweh. He is instead the one who brings, according to what scripture says, the abomination of desolation. That's mentioned in Daniel chapter 11 verse 31. It says, it says they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. And then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Dropping down to verse 36. It says, then the king, which is the Antichrist, shall do according to his own will. And he shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like Second or First Thessalonians? Actually, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And shall speak blasphemy against the God of gods. The reason also that we know he's Jewish is in verse 37. It says, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers. It also says, of, nor the desire of women. Nor regard any God, for he exalts himself above them all. So this is what is coming. And we see shapes of it already right now. There is what I've been calling for probably the last 20 years, the humanistic gospel. My observation of this started when my wife was watching uh, her favorite talk show during the day. It was hosted by a woman that you all would know if I mentioned her name. And uh, there would be, in her show, she would, she would value all of the things we value. Love and acceptance and peace and, and, and community and, 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 and shared responsibility. All of the things that are Christian. But she would do that with no mention of Jesus, no mention of a cross. It was a promotion of all the Christianity values without the cross, without the blood, without new birth, without transformation that Jesus brings. That if we can just, the idea with this humanistic gospel that is, is, is going to be probably the cornerstone of this false religion is that if we, if we can just get these things right, if we can just get these things done, then, then all of a sudden everything is going to get better, better. That's why, just so you understand, that is why in our educational structures there is a move toward acceptance without any level of morality. That may not be here in Canton we're, or, or in Troy. But if you look at where we're going, that's why we have, my brothers and sisters, I'm just going to talk real plain for a minute. And if anybody in, in this room is dealing with any of the stuff I'm talking about, we want you here. We're glad you're here. You should be here. This is not to alienate you. There's a Savior who died for you that wants to set you free. But that's why we have, like, um, people who are transvestites reading to our children at 
the local libraries. That's why we have trans story hour. That's why we have these, these love parades and love, um, I don't even know the name of it, like gatherings in communities. There was one in Tawanda not even a year ago where the focus is on we're just going to love each other regardless of, of where they are or what they're doing or what that looks like. And love is right. And you know what? I love everybody that participated there. That doesn't mean they're right. Love, they want love to define and make acceptance. But this is the problem, is that we've lost all moral bearing. And the reason that that has happened in the United States is by design. It's by design. Because they need to be able to promote the values of Christianity without Christian values. Without the value of the truth of Jesus and his gospel. They want all the benefits. There was, do you understand that there was no such thing as human rights before the cross? There was no such thing as human rights before Christianity. The, the, the origin of it is in Christian beliefs that every person matters. Romans used to take their babies, if they didn't want the baby, if the child had a defect, or they just had too many kids, or if it was a girl, God forbid. They would at times put that baby just in the alleyway and just allow, they had a, they had, they had alleys just like we do in major cities. And, and that would be where all the garbage went and all the other things. And, and they would put the babies in the back and just wait for the dogs to come and take the baby. Orphanages started when Christians who love people and saw the value in the child scooped that little baby up and brought him home. And all of a sudden there's 20 kids and all of a sudden there's 30 kids and they're feeding them and raising them as their own because they saw the value of people. That was a Christian thing. You are not valuing somebody if you don't tell them that there's a heaven and there's a hell. You are not valuing somebody by making them feel good for the moment. You are discriminating against them. When we do that, we are discriminating against those people because we're counting them unworthy of the blood of Jesus that will forgive their sins and save their soul. See, but because everybody wants peace, they will believe in the one who brings it and he will look like a savior. And those who will not worship him will be considered the, the radical religious. And you, my brothers and sisters, will be included in that number. Because we will not bow. Our focus on making disciples of Jesus Christ will be seen as being divisive. They're trying to create this one world government where everyone lives in peace. And everyone accepts each other for wherever they are and all that other mess. And they will say that us reaching for people with the gospel are being divisive and are, 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 are undermining their peace and the peace that they want to bring the world. Is anybody seeing this? Now, I want you to understand, this is where the scripture comes alive where it says that, that Jesus said that he would bring a sword and not peace. Jesus is the prince of peace. When he reigns somewhere, he brings peace. He is peace. When you find him, you find peace. But the thing is this, the rest of the world is going to see only the sword. They're going to see that we're, yeah, we're bringing peace to these people, but it's creating separation from the rest of the world. That is why we will be criminalized. And there is a view even now that is saying that we're bordering on terrorism. This is amazing. Atlantic, the Atlantic magazine in March 
10, 2016, asked this question. This is the question that was asked. This is the title of the article. You can look it up. Are conservative Christians religious extremists? Do you know who religious extremists are? Radicalized Islamics are religious extremists. They're equating you with someone who cuts babies' heads off. The tagline is this. New data shows that most Americans consider the beliefs and practices of traditionalist Christians to be extreme. This is a direct quote from the article. It says, conservative Christians share striking, uh, excuse me, striking similarities with Taliban terrorists. Or at least that is the argument laid out by Kimberly Blaker in her book from 2003, The Fundamentalist, excuse me, Fundamentals of Extremism, The Christian Right in America, conflating leaders like James Dobson of Focus on the Family with Islamic fundamentalists. Baker, Blaker argued that America's traditionalist Christians also seek to indoctrinate youth with oppressive views of women, minorities, LGBTQ persons, through mind control tactics and intimidation. That was almost 10 years ago. This coming one world religion of humanism will answer the third leg of the stool to create a sustainable system of one world control. All of this is going to bring, and, and you need to pay attention to this, because there's so much, there's so much silliness about the mark of the beast that's in our circles. And it, it has to do with misunderstanding. I'm going to read to you very quickly. I'm going to Revelation chapter 13. I'm reading verses 11 and 12. And then dropping down to verse 14, reading from the New King James Version. It says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now, just so you understand, for anyone who's never read the book of Revelation, it's all symbolism. Obviously, there's not going to be some dude who rolls up out of the earth with, like, horns. Right? <laughs> if you thought that, that was going to happen, I'm sorry for your disappointment. Um... But this is the false prophet. This is the religious leader of the Antichrist. It says in verse 12, it says, He exercises all the authority of the first beast, meaning the Antichrist, in his presence and causes the earth, causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. Verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him who understands calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. See, the false prophet, the false prophet's role, and this is important. You need to pay attention to this part. Okay? If you don't remember most of anything else I said, because I'm throwing a lot at you, remember this. If you want to go over and watch the videos again, do that. But this is where a lot of us get messed up. The false prophet is going to cause all the earth to worship the beast. He will work miracles that will seem to validate the greatness of the beast and his faith of humanism. 
it says that there will be an image of the beast that the false prophet will literally bring to life. How can that be? This image of the beast, it says, speaks and has those who will not worship the beast killed. And he's the one who is enforcing the number, the mark of 666. Now, I want you to hear me real clear on this. The mark of the beast will not be in a vaccine. Because I know that for sure, because the mark of the beast is a, is a mark of devotion. It is worship. It is, a, it is about worship. That is what the beast is after. He's after worship. That's why he's against God and everything that's named God. Because it's about worship. Now, it may be that you have to get an injection that's going to cause you to align yourself, to pledge allegiance to the beast and all that. Then you might want to be a little nervous. Because that sounds devotion. That sounds allegiance. What you allege, make your alliance with, what you are allegiant to, there is a large amount of devotion and support of. My brothers and sisters, be careful what you align yourself with. But the mark of the beast is going to be a mark of worship. And what's amazing is that it is going to affect our ability to buy and sell. But when you look at our current world system, okay, I am wrapping up, guys. How many here pay their bills electronically? It's only about half. If we were in the city, there'd be very few hands not up. Uh, it's how I pay my tithes. It's, it's how we can pay things internationally. Right now, we've done for years, we've supported uh, New Day Ministries. We have made deposits from here to our banks in Nicaragua electronically. So we already have a viable electronic economic system. But here's, here's, here's the thing. I'm just, I'm posing this. I don't know this for sure. I am not a prophet. And just so you know, just so everybody's clear, I am not an expert on, on prophecy. I have gotten a whole lot better for you for this month. But I am not an expert on prophecy. But they're talking about in the Bible how there will be an image and that's not like a picture. It's, it's going to be, the idea is like, like there will be a statue. There will be something made that is the image of the beast. And that that image will be given life. Now, I just want to pose a thought. Something that I've wondered for the last about 10 years. What if the image of the beast is AI? What if the image of the beast is an animated, self-aware internet? Do you see how easy it would be that you could not buy or sell without a mark? Now, I can't say definitively that that is going to happen that way. But it sure makes a lot of sense. See, Jesus died for us. Yeah. Let me just tell you the end of the story quick. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. This is the New Living Translation. It says, the beast was captured. That's the Antichrist. And with him the false prophet, who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. Miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image or his statue in this translation. 
Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That is the end. Chapter 20 of Revelation is where we see the new heavens and the new earth. And chapter 22 is the sum of it all. This is how this ends. But see, I need you to remember that throughout this entire book, this book is filled with warnings. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Paul says it. Jesus says it. Because it says the coming of the lawless one. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 10 says, With all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. My brothers and sisters, I want you to hear me. It is not enough to just simply have asked Jesus into your heart one day and then just park him. It, it, it is probably not even enough to just show up to church once a month and drop your tithe in our tithe boxes in the back. Because what I read, what I read here, is that they were deceived because they never received a love for the truth. The truth is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, to be able to forgive you. He paid the penalty of every wrong you've ever done so that he could say that you're not guilty, so that you could enter into heaven's gates, so that you could know what salvation is, so that he could heal your heart. That's the gospel. We need to love that, but we also we need to love his word. Because it, his word is truth. The Lord Jesus himself praying for us in John 17, prayed to the Father and said, Father, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We need to get to the place. We need to get to the place individually where we love him, we love his gospel, and we love his word. I was just at a conference. Bill Johnson spoke. Some of you will know who that is. He's very, very highly regarded in our circles. And he said, he said, he said, so many of you will tell me that you love Jesus. But do you love his word? Because this is Jesus in print. And we need... In this day, right now, with where we are, with all the things that are going on around us, honey, you got to know his book. Because that will let you know where your strength is. Right now, I just want to pray for you. Let's, uh, let's stand. The band's going to sing in just a moment. If you've been not treating Jesus in print the way that you should, I don't need you to make a big spectacle. I don't need you to come up afterward and tell me, Pastor, you know, whatever. I just need you to ask the Lord to forgive you. And I want you and I need you as a believer in Jesus Christ, as someone that I'm trying to shepherd to heaven. I need you tomorrow and later today to just open your book, open your Bible, and just read. Don't look for answers, look for him. 
Don't look for formulas of success. Look for him. Because he is here. How he thinks, what he feels, how he loves you is all here. So right now, if you've been, if you've been neglecting his word, I just want you to just take 30 seconds and ask him to forgive you. Just ask him to forgive you. And then I'm going to pray for you. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room and those who may be watching on video, either right now or, Lord, sometime in the future, that, Father, you give us, that we develop such a love for your word that it becomes, Lord God, the guideposts along the highway that we run, that your word becomes our directions and becomes our focus, that, that, Lord, it becomes how we think and how we feel past the environments we live in and past maybe even the passions of our own soul, that, Lord God, your word, your word would be how we think. Lord, I ask you, sanctify us with your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. If anybody wants to come and pray, please do. If you need healing, Jesus is always a healer, no matter what the message is. If you need healing, come up. Let somebody know that you need healing. But right now, right now, just, just take a moment and just pray. Ask the Lord. Father, give me a love for your truth. Jesus' name.
worship. Let's just worship right now. Let your worship just rise. Jesus has done for you because he did more than just simply buy you a ticket to heaven. He is the healer of your soul. Father, seal us in your spirit. Keep us by your truth. Lord, chart our course and let us follow you because, Father, we all want to see you on that day. We all want to be saved on that day. And on that day, every decision we've ever made that took us away from you, we will regret with the depths of our being when we see how good you really are. I ask you to bless, Lord God, these people, these your people. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. If you need to go, if you want prayer, come on up. We'll see you next week. Next week's going to be a fun message. It's been heavy, 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 and heavy. Next week's going to be fun. Next week we celebrate.